will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A little mic problem this morning. <laughs> So Jesus told them this story so they would keep praying and not lose heart. Sometimes it seems that no matter how hard we work, no matter how many jobs we juggle, we still can't pay the bills. No matter how much we need the treatment, the insurance company won't cover it. No matter how many protests we attend or letters we write or phone calls we make, we still can't get guns off the streets. When the world seems to wear us down, when the people who do the most damage seem to keep winning, and institutions that are supposed to give us justice seem unmovable and uncaring, losing heart is very real. For the people listening to Jesus in that afternoon in Galilee, it was very real too. Roman soldiers on every street corner, Peasants working the fields and still starving. Debtors' prisons filling up with people who couldn't make ends meet. And no matter how much the people suffered, nothing ever seemed to change. Jesus promised them that a new day was coming, something he called the kingdom of God, and it gave them hope. It would be a realm of justice and peace and compassion. Things would be made right. He promised that when he came back, they would experience it, but when would that be? How long would they have to wait? And what would they do in the meantime while the world just keeps turning business as usual? Jesus feels their frustration, and so he answers their question with a story. Not a feel-good motivational poster of that cat hanging on the bar, hanging there, baby, you know, kind of story, but a rather edgy one pitting the smallest, most powerful person imaginable, a widow, against the ultimate authority, a judge. Now in Hebrew, the word for widow is silent one, one who was unable to speak. Without their husbands, widows had no agency, no rights, no claim on anything or anyone except what someone would deign to give them. And judges had no obligation to care about their fate, or even to listen to their complaints. Those were the rules. And most of the time, this wasn't a problem, most of the time widows knew their place and just kept quiet and lived, or more frankly died, unseen and unheard. But this widow is different, Jesus says. This one won't keep quiet. There is something in her bones, in her heart, in her soul that knows she deserves justice. She's relentless and she just keeps showing up day after day, demanding what is owed to her until the judge just can't take it anymore. He doesn't relent to be kind or to dispense justice. He just doesn't care what people think. He doesn't care what God thinks. He just gets tired of listening to her and rules in her favor to shut her up. Now actually, the original translation goes a bit further. It says that he gives in because he didn't want her giving him a black eye day after day. <laughs> that is some feisty widow. <laughs> now my guess is that this story made Jesus' audience wince a little. After all, the widow wasn't playing by the rules. She was stepping out of bounds. She was challenging a respected authority. But remember, parables are no bedtime stories. They are made to disrupt the system, to subvert the norms. So yes, Jesus tells us, the widow was annoying, embarrassing, and rude. Yes, she forgot her place, and she made a lot of noise in the process. But Jesus tells us she is the one who models for us how to act in the face of injustice, black eyes and all. And it makes me think of any number of women young, old, famous, not so famous, who were supposed to be the silent ones, but couldn't keep quiet when they knew that something was wrong, who, in, who knew in their bones, their heart, their souls, that they were deserving of justice, and they just decided to keep pestering the people in charge until they were heard. Now there's a long line of these women in the scriptures. There's Tamar, Ruth, Hannah, Mary, outsider women in tough situations who spoke out for God's justice in a deaf and uncaring world. 
and there's so many of us in our own history. Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And there's those who are speaking out and making that kind of history today. I think of Malala Yousafzai, the young Pakistani woman who was shot by the Taliban for daring to go to school. But rather than let fear silence her, she recovers from her wounds and she returns to school again and again, demanding her right to learn. Her persistence caught the attention of the world and she was invited to speak to the UN General Assembly and there she shared these words. So here I stand, one girl among many. I raise my voice, not so that I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. The terrorists thought that they would change our aims and stop our ambitions, but nothing changed in my life except this. Weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. Strength, power, and courage was born. No one can stop us. We will speak up for our rights and we will bring change through our voice. We must believe in the power and the strength of our words. Our words can change the world. And I think of Greta Thunberg, the Swedish teenager who turned her despair over the climate crisis into righteous anger and refused to go to school until her government showed the courage to do something. At first, the protest was just her, sitting alone outside Parliament with her sign, Strike for Climate. She was an oddity, an embarrassment even. But little by little, others joined her. Soon, other students in other towns were doing the same thing, and a year later, Greta's movement inspired the largest global climate march in history. She had no experience, she had no connections, but she had the deep convictions in her heart, her bones, her soul, and she could not stay silent. When she addressed the UN Assembly, she said, since our leaders are behaving like children, we will have to take the responsibility they should have taken long ago. Because we are facing an existential threat. We can no longer save the world by playing by the rules because the rules have changed. Our leaders have ignored us in the past and they will ignore us again. So we come here to let them know that change is coming, whether they like it or not. The people will rise to the challenge. These two young women were unknown, silent ones, until they claimed their God-given power to speak out. But this passage also made me think of a woman who has a voice, a woman who has been part of the power system but has used her voice to speak truth to power from the inside. Someone who annoys powerful men by not shutting up. It happened during the confirmation hearings of Attorney Jeff Sessions, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Appalled by Sessions' awful civil rights record, Senator Elizabeth Warren stood up on the Senate floor and after she cast her vote against his nomination, she began to read into the record a letter from Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King's widow. The letter described how during the civil rights movement, Sessions had worked to prevent voting rights for African Americans and that his unjust racist behavior was a disgrace. Now at this point, the presiding chair of the Senate interrupted her, reminding her of the rules mm -hmm. which prohibits ascribing to another senator any conduct or motive unworthy or unbecoming a senator. When Warren, Warren asked whether reading King's letter, which actually had already been admitted into the Senate record in 1986 over a similar issue, whether that was a violation of Senate rules, the Senate chair again quoted the rule to her and told her to sit down and stop. Yet Warren continued reading the letter. When this time Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell interrupted her saying, the Senator has impugned the motives and conduct of our colleague from Alabama as was warned by the chair. Warren said she was surprised that the words of Coretta Scott King were not suitable for debate in the United States Senate and she requested to continue. McConnell objected and called for a vote shutting her down saying the senator will take her seat, preventing her from continuing, silencing her for the duration of the confirmation hearings. And after the vote passed, and it barely passed, 
Senator McCollin, M McConnell explained his actions with these words. Senator Warren was giving a lengthy speech. She had appeared to violate the rules. She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. Amen. Nevertheless, she persisted. Amen. They all persisted. Mm -hmm. The student, the activist, the senator, the widow. Four women who were told to sit down and be quiet. To ignore the injustice they saw. To let the powers that be call the shots. But they would not. They could not. And it wasn't because they knew they would prevail. They didn't. The odds were certainly stacked against them. But there was something in the act of demanding justice that changed them, that gave them the courage they needed. Pastor and preacher Barbara Brown Taylor describes the widow's persistence this way. She was willing to say what she wanted, out loud, day and night, over and over again, whether she got it or not, because saying it was how she remembered who she was. It's how she remembered the shape of her heart. And I believe it's how she learned the shape of God's heart. Which to take a little poetic license with the words attributed to Dr. Martin Luther King always bends towards justice. Persistence in speaking truth to power is an act of faith, an act of sacred resistance to an unjust system. It says we believe in the justice of God. And so it is indeed a form of prayer, a prayer that embodies and aligns us with the vision of all those silent ones, ancient, modern, scriptural, historical, who knew in their bones, in their hearts, in their souls, that God has a different dream for us than the nightmare we may find ourselves living in. This kind of prayer, my friends, is not about piously bowing our heads, but about firmly planting our feet, opening our mouths, and taking a stand. It's a bold, tenacious, in-your-face, and yet persistent kind of faith. It's prayer that dares to speak God's vision out loud again and again, as long as it takes, and it has the power to change the shape of our hearts. And if we can change our hearts, we just might find the courage to change the world. Or at least, to keep the powers that be a little nervous and on their toes in the meantime. And to give God more to work with when the time is right. And that, my friends, is where that arc of justice starts. And it ends in the kingdom of God that Jesus promises us. The world may turn an uncaring and unhearing ear. The world may try to shut us down. But we know the day of justice will come. Nevertheless, we will persist. May it be so. Amen. Amen.